Welcome everybody to the first lecture that finally integrates all the things that we have learned so far about quantum computing and machine learning. In today's talk, I want to give you a high level overview of what it means to actually build a quantum machine learning model. What is quantum machine learning in the first place and why should we think about it and how should we think about it? In doing that, we'll discuss a very simple quantum model called a quantum classifier. And thereafter, we'll discuss the limitations of this model, whether it's even advantageous in the first place to do this, and then lead into some discussions about how we can think about building more interesting models. But first, a small recap on why, why should we even go quantum in terms of machine learning? And I think when you ask somebody, what is the benefit or what is the potential benefit of quantum machine learning, they're very quick to answer, with a response that relates to the benefits of quantum computing in general, right? And so quantum computing very nicely has access or gives us access to this exponential state space in which we can apply computations in. So this slide, which you would have undoubtedly seen before, it's a very beautiful one. The idea is very nice where it says that with just 275 qubits, we can already represent more basis states, more computational basis states than there are atoms in the observable universe. So with arguably quite a little bit of resources on the quantum computing side, we can already represent an enormous, enormous space. The key, of course, is using that space in an advantageous manner, which is not always so easy to do. But besides the exponential state space that we have access to through quantum computation, what I think is even more interesting or more important, more fascinating, is the idea of interference and the fact that qubits and states and things like that can, you know, these quantum behaviors that come in with quantum interference is something very strange. And probability amplitudes, which you would have learned about in the first couple of talks, the fact that amplitudes can cancel each other out and we can have this interference really creates a different way to think about probability. In fact, we can think about quantum mechanics as providing us a generalization of probability theory. Since these probability amplitudes can cancel out and do these strange things, we have now a more general framework to think about probability. And in classical machine learning, we know that probability theory is the backbone of inference and statistical modeling and all these things that we really want to do. And now if we replace the classical probability theory with a generalized version of probability theory, can we do something interesting in that context and in that regard? So if you ask somebody what quantum machine learning is, or if you Google it, I think you will almost always be directed to this picture here. And in this picture, what is happening is quantum machine learning is being cast into four paradigms, or let's just say machine learning in general is being cast into four paradigms. And in each of these blocks, you have an interplay between whether your data is classical or quantum, and whether the device or the computer that you're using to process that data is classical or quantum. So, for example, in the top left block here, we've got CC. CC is a classical data set that is processed with a classical computer. So this will be your typical um, classical machine learning that lies in this, in this paradigm, this dimension. Then below that, we've got QC. We've got quantum data that's processed on a classical computer. So maybe this implies that you set up some experiment in the lab, and then you get this data that comes out of some quantum experiment that you can process or you can model with classical classical techniques on a classical computer. This is also quite common. Then on the bottom right, we have QQ, quantum data that's processed on a quantum computer. But when I speak about quantum machine learning and when most of my when most of us speak about quantum machine learning for the next couple of talks, we will really be focusing on the idea of having classical data processed somehow or interplaying somehow with a quantum computer. So we'll be talking about this block here, CQ, having classical data that is somehow modeled, enhanced, or processed with a, quant with a quantum computer. This is the idea of quantum machine learning. But of course, there are other blocks and other definitions, but I think it's safe to say that 
for the purposes of these talks, we'll be talking about this block here. Okay. So now, once we have um, this idea of what we're trying to do with this notion of quantum machine learning, processing classical data on a quantum computer somehow, we can start to think about how can quantum computers fit into the framework of classical machine learning. So I presented to you in the classical machine learning talks the rough framework about how we can think about model optimization, function approximation, and so on. And so we always start with the notion of some data, and then we throw that data into a model. Then what comes out of the model is a prediction that we can then score with a cost function and figure out how to update our model's parameters based on gradient-based techniques. So now a question is, can we take this model that's in this kind of block here and replace it with something, some, some piece of computation that runs on a quantum computer. So can we replace it with a quantum model or can we perhaps replace certain parts of a model by a quantum computation that is beneficial or advantageous? And so this is the way that we kind of formulate quantum machine learning in general. And before we do that, I want to just remind you of the whole idea of having near-term versus fault-tolerant quantum computation and quantum computers available to us. So the near-term devices are those that we have available today, right? Those are the smaller devices that are typically noisier, and you would have remembered from an earlier talk that these devices suffer from a lot of errors. And then the opposite end of that is the fault-tolerant regime. And so when people design and think about quantum machine learning algorithms, there are really kind of two two parties. The first try to design and, and, and run and optimize algorithms that run on these near-term devices, and the others design more theoretical algorithms that we know can be advantageous or run in an efficient way when we have these fault-tolerant quantum computers, when we have these quantum computers that are error-free and, um, and we can then do these interesting fault-tolerant algorithms. And so today, what I want to focus on is what can we do now? Um, what can we do with these noisy, error-prone, small devices that suffer from a lot, a lot of noise and, um, and are often not quantum? The qubits are not quantum for very long, right? So what models can we actually build today that make use of quantum computers in a machine learning context, of course? So that brings me to the idea and the notion of variational models. And variational models can very, very easily be thought of as just a quantum circuit that contains some parameters in it that we, we want to train and optimize and tweak. Okay, so let's look at some pictures. Let's say that we have this circuit. This is a very general circuit that starts with some input state. I call this psi. And then we apply some unitary operations here. So we know what kind of gates. We can apply gates. We can apply some, some evolution here. And then we can do some sort of measurement to our system. Now, a variational model is exactly a quantum circuit, right? That looks like this with one difference. The difference is that the operations we apply can depend on some parameters. They can depend on parameters that we can specify, that we can train and we can optimize. And remember that when we measure quantum systems, the output is stochastic in nature. And so typically what we do is we repeat measurements multiple times to get an expectation value of the output. So we get a probability distribution of possible basis states when we do measurements of a quantum circuit. This is important because if we change our parameter sets, we change the distribution or the, um, the statistics of our circuit. And this is something that we must remember. Okay, so... Ah, and one more thing that I think is important to say, especially if you're reading literature and, um, and research papers, is that this variational circuit, or this, this model, the circuit that depends on some parameters, often goes by a lot of different names. It goes by parameterized circuit, or parameterized quantum circuit, parameterized quantum model. It's also called um, variational circuit, variational model, interchangeably. And then there's also this kind of strange word, which you might not have seen before if you are new to quantum computing. Um, and this is an ansatz. 
So the variational model, the parameterized quantum circuit, is also referred to as an ansatz. And an ansatz just means that you have a template or a circuit that acts as a template, and the circuit has parameters in it. So all these words are kind of used interchangeably, and they refer to a variational circuit. All right. So now as a first attempt at quantum machine learning, let's look at how we can build a simple model. And in particular, can we use a variational circuit as a classifier, as a model to classify data, to classify classical data? And you would think, based on what I've told you already, that this is, this is viable, right? Because a variational circuit is just something that depends on some parameters that we can tweak, train, and optimize, and it's taking some input and giving us some output. So in some sense, it very much mimics the black box model structure that we, that we discussed in classical machine learning. So can we use a variational circuit to do exactly this thing, to take in data in our machine learning concept, context and give us a prediction for a label or a target or an answer or a distribution? And the answer is, yes, we can. So we can definitely try to swap out whatever this model was. Let's say, for example, we had a machine learning um, a machine learning setting where we used a linear model. We could replace this linear model instead with a variational circuit and see, do we get any improvements or enhancements? But what are the steps that we need to consider here? Because we have classical data, we want to get an output or a prediction that's meaningful for us in our machine learning task and setting. So how do we go about setting up this architecture with a variational circuit as the classifier or the model? So let's look at a task to specifically describe the steps that we need to, to understand and complete in order to do this task. So the task is train a quantum circuit, so a variational circuit, on labeled samples, so we have a supervised setting here where we know we have the labels, so that we can predict labels for new data. So when we get some new data samples, we can make predictions using our trained variational circuit. And so we can summarize the steps that we need to do to build this quantum classifier as the following. The first step is figuring out how to encode our classical data into a quantum computer, right? So how do we even get our classical information into a quantum computer so that we can process it with a quantum model? So how do we represent our data as a quantum state? This is the first question that we have to investigate and answer. The second is then once we have our data in a quantum state um, encoded into the quantum computer, how do we apply a model, right? What does it mean to actually apply this parameterized model? What do these operations need to look like? After we figure out how to apply the model to the data, well, then we need to measure our circuit, right? Then we need to measure our model in this sense, in, in, the, in the quantum setup, so that we can extract labels. We can extract the labels for our classification problem to classify the data. And once we have the labels, well, then we need to figure out how to do optimization. We need to figure out how to go back into our quantum circuit, tweak, optimize, and change those parameters such that we get a variational model that gives us good predictions, that gives us good model answers. So how can we use optimization techniques like gradient descent, which we discussed in the last lecture, to update model parameters? Can we even do that in the first place? Okay, so let's start by, by discussing data encoding. Data encoding is exactly trying to answer step one of these tasks. So how do we encode classical data into a quantum state? Well, luckily for us, there are lots of different ways that are proposed in literature to get classical data or information into a quantum state or a quantum computer. I will discuss a few methods, but what I want to highlight at the start is that this is still an open question and an open problem. Encoding classical data into a quantum state, there is no hard and fast rule on how to do that. In fact, it depends very much on your problem, and very often you will need to use different data encoding techniques. And 
none of them have really been shown to be truly beneficial in a certain context. And if it has been shown, it's probably for a very, very specific problem. So bear that in mind that how you encode your data into a quantum state is still up for discussion. So what I will present to you here are some proposals from literature. So the first is this idea of basis encoding. And as the name suggests, you simply encode classical data into basis states, into computational basis states. So what does that mean? Well, imagine that you just have two qubits in your quantum circuit. If you have two qubits, well, then you know that the possible basis states you can have are 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. What basis encoding says is that if we have some data, let's say x1, x2, uh, these are two different data points. What we need to do to the data points is somehow convert them to a binary representation. So let's say x1 corresponds to 0, 1, and um, x2 corresponds to 1, 1 in binary, in binary form. So basis encoding basically says, let's set up a circuit such that we can encode our data, x1 and x2, and associate them with the appropriate basis states that they represent. So we'd encode x1 into this basis state and x2 into this basis state. And this basis state here would have zero likelihood and this basis state here would have zero likelihood. So I'm not going to show you circuits that do this, this uh, encoding because they can be rather complicated, but the intuition is very simple to follow. We simply have classical data. We need to figure out how to represent that classical data in binary form, which is quite common to do actually, or not so hard to do, I should say. Once we have our classical data in binary representation, we can encode it into basis states into a quantum computer. But then another idea is the idea of amplitude encoding. So instead of encoding your classical data or information into basis states, why not actually encode it into amplitude vectors? So if you recall from one of the first lectures, if you have a quantum circuit, let's say again, which is two qubits, how will the quantum state look? Well, we can represent it by a ket vector, right? So we'll have zero tensor zero, and we can write this thing as a ket vector with four entries. It's two to the n entries, where n is the number of qubits. So if we have two qubits, it will be four entries. So this is our state our, that that's in the zero state, right? So this is our vector that's in the zero state. So now what amplitude encoding says is it says, apply some rotations here. I'm just going to write these rotations as U, and these rotations must somehow encode your data. So let's just say um, we do some rotations that depend on some angles. Um, let's call these angles, what should we call them, beta? And then when we look at the quantum state after we apply these rotations and these angles, now let's say we call this quantum state psi, then what the psi looks like is a new vector. And this new vector, this ket vector, encodes your classical data. So if, for example, we have a data point, say x1, and this data point has four features in it, so it's like... I don't know, these numbers probably don't make sense, but let's just say 0 0.8, 0 0.1, 0, and 0 0.1, for example. Then when we look at our probability amplitude vector, this, this, these amplitudes in this vector need to correspond to this data. So these are obviously, these are not normalized, so these numbers exactly won't make sense, but the idea is to somehow manipulate the probability amplitude vector such that what you read in here is the same numbers that correspond to your classical data vector. So you're encoding your data vectors into probability amplitudes, and hence the name amplitude encoding. Again, we won't go through the details of the circuits and the, um, and the operations that one has to do to load these, 
but a lot of um, software packages already have these, these templates that allow you to do amplitude encoding quite easily. So this is quite nice. But now we'll go into a little bit more details on, on encoding. And I really like this um, idea of amplitude encoding because it's quite intuitive and simple to understand. So, um, ah, angle encoding, yes. So let's discuss with an example. So let's say um, we have data that has two features. So the data is two dimensional, the classical data. So we can write the data as a vector with two entries. And I'm not gonna say what they are, I'm just gonna say it's the first feature we note as eight, x1, second feature we write as x2. Now with angle encoding, what this says is, based on how many features we have in our data, then this is how many qubits we need in our system, in our model. So we have two features, so we need two qubits to set up this example. So let's say we start with, in fact, let me spread this up. Let's say we start with now two qubits in the ground state. And angle encoding very, very simply says, well, with each qubit, we will associate them with each feature value and encode each feature value by rotating the qubits about an angle that depends on the feature value. So what does that mean? Let me write it down and maybe this, that will make things more clear. It means we apply an operation to the first qubit and this will be a rotation about some axis, let's say about the z-axis, and the angle that we rotate this first qubit will depend on the value of the first feature. So it will depend on the value x1. And then the second qubit, we do something similar. We do a rotation about an axis, say the z-axis, and this time the angle at which we rotate the second qubit will depend on the second feature value. So now what we're doing is we're encoding our information, our classical data, classical information, into angles of rotations for qubits. And if we had to increase the number of features in our data, let's say our, um, our data suddenly kind of, let's say had three entries instead of, of just two, so we had an extra x, x3 here, well then we would just simply add another qubit to our system and encode the third feature value in a similar fashion, where we do a rotation, about an angle that depends on the third feature value. So this is the idea of angle encoding. Very simple, very intuitive. Then there was this introduction of a concept called higher, higher order encoding. The higher order encoding is similar to, or starts off similar to the idea of angle encoding, but with a little bit more extra, uh, extra steps. And so let's again assume that we have a two-dimensional data vector that we want to encode. So this data vector here can be written like that. Now with a higher order encoding, what we do is again, we have the number of qubits equal to the number of features. So in this case, we've got two features, so we have two qubits. And then we apply Hadamard gate, so we put the qubits in uniform superposition. Thereafter, we encode our first, our first and second feature values through rotations. So we do very similar to what we did in the, um, in the angle encoding, where we, we do rotations about some axis, and this depends on the feature values. Then what we do in this higher encoding strategy, this is where something becomes a little bit different. We apply some entanglement gates, so we do some entanglement between qubits, so we do C naught gate. And then we start to apply or encode rotations again about some axis. And this time the angle depends on the product of feature values. So X1 times X2. So now we're not only just encoding rotations of the first feature value and the second feature value, we're also now encoding rotations that depend on the product of feature values. And this is why we call this data encoding strategy the higher order encoding method, because we're encoding higher orders of our data.
And usually what people do as well is they often repeat this encoding strategy and there are theoretical reasons why one should do this, which I won't go into now, but these encoding blocks can be repeated, so they can be stacked upon each other. And this is referred to as the depth of your feature map. When you increase the depth uh, or the repetitions of your feature map, then this is re repeating these blocks in the feature map structure. Okay, so this is another example of, higher, of data encoding and how to get classical information into a quantum state. Now, once we've done that, how do we apply our variational model? So let's go back and just say we've got some qubits in our circuit. We figure out how to encode our data, which I'm just going to denote by this very big block and call it like u of x. So this whatever is happening in here is encoding our data. Now, what comes after? What do we do to apply some sort of model, which I'll call W, and this model will depend on some parameters, theta, say a vector. Now, what does this need to look like? How do we think about constructing a variational model, a model or a circuit that depends on some parameters that we train and optimize? And again, this is an open question. How to design this model, this variational part, efficiently is still um, up for discussion. There are a lot of research in this area trying to figure out exactly how we should design circuits with, um, with certain benefits and trade-offs, but in general, this is still also largely being investigated. So one research paper that I thought was quite interesting and one of the first trying to answer this question was, um, was called Expressibility and Entangling Capability of Parameterized Quantum Circuits for hybrid quantum classical algorithms. Quite a mouthful. But what they did in this paper was really, really quite beautiful and quite simple. They tried to understand if I have a variational circuit with a certain structure, how can I access, how much can I sample um, from the full Hilbert space of the model? So if I have a circuit with some variational parameters or some variational operations, Based on those operations, how much can I access or tap into the full Hilbert space that my model has uh, that my model contains? So, just to make that more concrete, let's look at these pictures here. So, in the first setting of very low expressibility, right? So this this side does not have access to the full Hilbert space. Let's just assume an example with just one qubit. So, one qubit we know we can represent by the block sphere. And if we just do an identity in this one qubit circuit, well then whatever we can tap into in the block sphere is obviously nothing really, right? So the, what we can sample is nothing. Um, and then once we start to do a little bit more interesting things. So let's say now we put our qubit into superposition and then we apply a rotation about the z-axis and we sample different different values for the angle at which we can rotate around the z-axis. So we sample for lots of different theta values. These theta values would tell us the angle at which we rotate around the z-axis. And now we can see that what we can sample or tap into from the block sphere is now around this axis here. And then as we start to do more general things, so we start to do rz and then rx, then we can start to sample more from the full Hilbert space, from the full block sphere in this example. And then when we get to a complete arbitrary unitary that allows us to like kind of navigate everywhere in Hilbert space, we essentially get exactly that. We're able to tap into the full Hilbert space. So you might immediately think, um, well, then we should design our variational model such that it's always able to tap into the full Hilbert space. But it turns out that this high expressive variational circuit, this highly expressive model, is not always advantageous. And these reasons will be brought up in um, some of the future talks. But keep that in mind, that high expressibility is not always uh, a good thing.
And just to continue for completeness of this, um, of what these variational models look like, in the same paper that I mentioned just now, they also explore lots of different types of ansatz, so lots of different types of variational models and circuits that one could use. And um, here is just like a snapshot of all the different circuits that explored, but you can see that there is um, a rough similar structure in the variational circuit. So I will just describe one example of a typical variational model that's used in a lot of these variational quantum classifiers. So if we go back and we draw our, um, our circuit again, and we just leave our data encoding step as some block that encodes our data, then what happens in the variational part is typically we have um, we have some rotations that are applied to each qubit, and these rotations are about a certain axis, let's say the y-axis, but this time these rotations are parameterized by um, by trainable parameters, right? So I call them theta. So the structures of these variational models are usually such that we do a set of rotations on every qubit that depends on a different angle. So let's just do that, R y theta n. And then after we do these, um, these, these uh, single qubit rotations that are parameterized, then what follows is typically some entangling layers. So there's, we entangle qubits one and two, and so on and so forth. This is probably not a very good drawing, but I think you get the idea that we do these entangling layers and how these entangling layers form, we can also just, we could just do pairwise entanglement, meaning we just, we just entangle neighbors, nearest neighbors of qubits, but we could also do all to all entanglement where every possible qubit is entangled with every possible qubit. So these are also different design options that we have in the variational model. And now if we want to in increase the number of parameters in our model, what's usually done is this block here of these parameterized rotations along with the entanglement is repeated. So if we repeat, repeat it. If we repeat this block multiple times, then we start to increase the number of parameters in our variational model. So this is an example of a very basic variational circuit that consists of parameterized RY rotations, some entanglement, and then we can repeat this block over and over to increase the number of parameters in our model, which should increase the, um, the uh, expressibility of our model. Okay. Um, and you might be asking or thinking, well, I'm just doing RY rotations here. Maybe I could add in RX, RZ. This is all completely valid. So um, feel free to also play around with some code and some models and set up these variational circuits to see exactly what kind of results you get out of, um, out of these models. All right. So now that we've discussed our data encoding and we've discussed an example for our variational model, which depends on some parameters theta. How do we go about extracting labels from the circuit? How do we measure this, this quantum model such that what we get out of here is something we can interpret as a label for our machine learning task? So this, again, is also still debatable, still an open question, and what I will present to you today are two options that have been done in literature. So the first comes from this paper called Supervised Learning with Quantum Enhanced Feature Spaces. This is a brilliant paper, and you will hear more and more about it in the next couple of talks, but um, I just want to explain the method of how they extract labels in, in their example of their quantum classifier. So what they do is they do something called a parity post-processing step. Now this parity post-processing step is um, actually rather 
I think rather intuitive, if you'll allow me to explain. So once we have our circuit that encodes our data and um, applies some variational model, which we choose some parameters for, we can then measure the system. So let's just, for example, say we just have two qubits again for simplicity. We encode our data. We do some operations that depend on some parameters. And then what we do is we can measure um, we can measure the system. And now we can measure in some computational basis. And what we can get out of the measurements, or what we usually typically get out of the measurements, if you remember from the first couple of lectures, is we'll end up with a probability distribution over possible basis states. Now, in this case of two qubits, we'll have, um, let me say two qubits, we'll have possible basis states of 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 that we can measure. And now remember that quantum measurements are stochastic in nature. So we have to repeat the um, experiment, the measurements over and over and over. We do multiple shots. These shot-based measurements give us a probability distribution or an expectation for achieving or measuring each of these possible basis states. So each of these basis states will have a probability associated with it. So let's say after doing, um, after choosing some parameters and encoding some data and repeating the experiment multiple times to get a distribution of outputs, that we get um, a probability of 0, 0, that's equal to, let's say, 0 0.8, and 0, 1, we get a probability of 0 0.1, then we never measure 1, 0, and we measure 1, 1, 0 0.1 of the time as well. So now what the parity post processing um, function does is it says, based on the parity of the possible basis states, now the parity of the basis states can either be even or odd, then it maps that the even and odd parity to different classes. So it does a binary classification mapping. So if we have even parity for a specific bit string, this would correspond to, let's say, class 1, for example. If we have odd parity for a bit string, this will correspond to class negative 1. And so if we look at our possible basis states here, we know that um, 0, 0 has even parity, 0, 1 has odd parity, 1, 0 has odd parity, and 1, 1 has even parity. And so what we do is we sum the probabilities associated with the even parity, so even, even, and that will give us 0 0.8, so let's just say even parity will be 0 0.8 plus 0 0.1. So that will be 0 0.9. And so this corresponds to the probability of our data point being in class positive 1 and 1. So let me actually erase that. It looks a little bit confusing. But what we're doing is based on the parity result of our bit string, we are summing the appropriate probabilities to get a probability over a label, over, over a certain class. So our probability of y hat being in class, being class 1, is equal to 0 0.9. And then similarly, the odd parity is summed such that we can get a answer for how likely it is for our model to be um, in class negative 1. So in this case, that would be the probability that y hat equals negative 1, and that's just going to simply be 0 0.1 plus 0, so that's 0 0.1, for example. So this is the idea of the parity post-processing function. Now, you might be thinking, well, that seems a little bit subjective, and um, why should we do that? And um, there is some justifications as why, and I encourage you to go read the paper. But a perhaps more simple and intuitive method 
is to simply just measure the first cubit. We can measure the first cubit and interpret that instead as a probability of our label. So let's assume again that we have a binary classification problem that um, needs to be mapped either to label plus one or label minus one, class plus one, class minus one. So if we have a circuit that, again, just does this data encoding step, does some variational stuff after. Now what we could do is just simply measure the first qubit and ignore the rest. And we could do that, let's say, in the sigma z basis. And this would give us a value that lies between, somewhere between, minus 1 and plus 1. And so we could just threshold the value. We can, we can come up with a rule, for example, if it's, um, let's say, if z, I'll call this z, if it's less than 0, then we map to class negative 1. Otherwise, if it's greater than or equal to 0, then we map to class plus, plus 1. Okay, so this might seem a little bit strange, right? So why would we just measure the first qubit? Doesn't that seem a little bit trivial? Don't we lose some sort of information in, in doing that? Now let's just unpack the intuition of this, of this idea a little bit more. So if we just measure the first qubit, let's just call this simple measurement strategy. I'm just going to, and we ignore everything else. I'm going to call this simple measurement strategy M. So this M represents the observable where we just measure the first qubit and ignore everything else. Now, what, what if we had a very complicated measurement strategy? So let's say not just measuring the first qubit and not just in the sigma z basis. Let's say we had some crazy um, measurement observable. And I'll call this measurement, this very complicated measurement strategy, um, MC, M for complicated, for example. Now, what's really neat and a really, really nice idea is that any kind of complicated measurement observable or strategy can be written or decomposed as, um, as some rotations that happen before an easy measurement strategy like M, like our original, our original um, suggestion of just measuring the first qubit and doing nothing out thereafter. So we can actually decompose very complicated measurement strategies by thinking about just having some rotations before we do an easy measurement. So the fact that we have a variational circuit applied before the measurement, we can kind of think about our variational circuit being able to absorb or learn anything that's needed, any kind of rotations needed for a complicated measurement strategy. So if we had a complicated measurement strategy that was necessary for our model, we could write it as rotations that are absor absorbed into the variational form and then just do a simple measurement. So this is a, quite a neat idea in that um, we don't actually need a very complicated measurement observable because our variational circuit can, in theory, learn like these complicated relationships or complicated things needed for this complicated measurement, and then we can just, in practice, implement a simple measurement. Okay, cool. So that's also an idea of how to extract a label for binary classification. If you want to generalize these to multi-label classification, there are also suggestions and ideas to do that, and I encourage you to read up about it in, in literature. Okay, so now that we have an idea or an understanding of how to extract labels from our model, we know how to encode data, we know how, well, we have an idea of how to encode data, we have an idea of how to apply a parameterized model, and we have an idea of how to extract labels and, and outputs. Now, how can we do optimization? Can we even do it in the first place? And in particular, can we use all these nice results from classical machine learning theory where we have uh, the ability to compute gradients of our cost function? Now, gradients, computing gradients of our cost function involves or needs computing gradients of our model. Now, with neural networks, for example, this was 
this was the killer. This was the reason why we had AI winter in history, because nobody really knew how to optimize neural networks in an efficient manner until we had backpropagation and automatic differentiation that came around to tell us how we could compute gradients efficiently with respect to parameters. So now, can we do the same thing with our quantum circuit? When we have a model that depends on a quantum computation, on a quantum circuit, can we compute the gradient of our model? Can we compute the gradient of a quantum circuit? And thankfully, the answer is yes, we can. And um, I put a link again to a, a paper here that explains this idea of computing something called the parameter shift rule. So computing the gradient of a circuit is actually a very beautiful, simple idea. And um, I write it here in this picture form. This is not entirely accurate. I think there's a factor of two missing or something like that. But we can think of the gradient of a circuit with respect to parameters um, like such where we have some circuit, this tensor n just means we have n qubits in the circuit. Then if we have some parameters, we can compute the gradient of the circuit with respect to the parameters by shifting the parameters up a small amount, s, doing the measurements. And then we subtract this measurement output from the shifting up circuit by the same circuit, but this time we shift the parameters down by a small amount, s. And so we get the measurement from that, sh that negative shift. So the gradient is simply the difference, roughly the difference between these two circuits. We shift the parameters up, we shift the parameters down, we measure in both cases, and we can compute the difference. And so this is called the parameter shift rule, and it's how we can compute gradients of, of quantum circuits. So this is possible. And the nice thing about this in practice is that these shifts are macroscopic so that we can actually implement them in labs. So this is not an unrealistic, um, an unrealistic thing to do and to compute. And there are um, software packages that do this for us. We can actually compute gradients of quantum circuits using Qiskit and so on. And, um, and you will see this in some of the labs as well. And the nice thing about this gradient uh, parameter shift rule is that it looks very similar to the finite difference rule, where we can compute um, gradients as well in um, or derivatives in a classical setting as well. OK, so now we've discussed very generally or a generic framework to build a quantum classifier. This consisted of figuring out how to encode our data, then the variational model, then um, getting labels, and then plugging in our labels into a cost function, which we did not define, but we can borrow classical cost functions, and, um, and use gradient descent to figure out how to update the parameters of our model. So the fact that we can compute gradients of our circuit is really, really nice because we can use gradient descent optimizers like we do in classical machine learning to go back and figure out how to update the parameters in our circuit so that we get a better model with better predictions and better outputs. But now, is this actually advantageous? Is there any benefit in doing this, this all these computations classically where we know we have lots of like models in, in real life, in, in uh, classical machine learning that work very well. We have, um, we have neural networks, we have these support vector machines and so on. So what is the advantage here? Well, let's take a step back to answer this question and think about what is actually going on with data encoding. So data encoding in a quantum setting is actually something that you would recognize from a previous lecture. So let's think about what's going on here. Let's say we've got a classical, we've got our classical data, and our classical data is again two dimensional. Okay, my favorite example. So that means we can write it as a vector with two entries. Now, if we want to encode this data into a quantum state, and let's say we want to use um, n qubits, n qubits to encode this classical data vector. Well, then what we are doing is we are encoding this this data point or this data now into a state, into a quantum state, let's call it 5x. And this quantum state can be written as a vector with 2 to the n entries. 
right, so if it's got one, two to the n entries. So if we were to use, let's just say, um, two qubits, right, so let's say two qubits, and we are essentially encoding our data now into a four dimensional vector. So I'm going to call it like x prime one, x prime two, x prime three, and x prime four. So we are in some sense taking our original data and mapping it now into a higher dimensional space. So this might sound familiar to you because when we discussed the idea or the notion of feature maps in support vector machines, the idea of a feature map was to take data that was not linearly separable and cast it into a higher dimension, map it mathematically into a high dimensional space such that the data becomes linearly separable. And so we can think about encoding data into a quantum state as exactly this analogy, as a feature map, transforming our data that exists in one space into another typically higher dimensional state space. And so we can actually think of this entire framework of building this quantum classifier as a linear classifier in feature space, where this feature space now corresponds to a feature map that we have encoded our classical data into a quantum state. So we are essentially just taking our data, putting it into a quantum state arbitrarily, and then doing a linear classification on the state. So in some sense, we don't really know what's going on there. We don't have a very deep understanding of, of, um, of what this means. And this attempt, this quantum classification, at the moment does not provide any advantage. We are essentially doing linear classification of some feature map data. So studying the feature map, how to embed your data into a quantum state is really the key information, the key thing here to do. And at the moment, there have been several suggestions, there have been ideas for what feature maps are good and how we should think about these classifiers and, and, um, and state spaces. And this will very much be a topic for um, the future lectures that come. Okay, so now we can finally just do a quick recap on what we, what we covered today. So the first thing we covered was how to encode our data into a quantum state. We spoke about basis encoding. We spoke about amplitude encoding. Ah, amplitude. My spelling is horrible. <laughs> amplitude encoding, angle encoding, where we encode into the rotations of the angles of the qubits. Um, and those angles depend on the values of our data. And then we also spoke about this idea of this higher order encoding strategy, where we also use um, angles that depend on products of feature values. Then we discussed some variational models that typically have like these rotations on every qubit, and then some entanglement. But again, these design choices are very much open for discussion. We then also spoke about getting a label out of our circuit and then doing optimization of our model. And optimization, thankfully, is possible because we can compute gradients, gradients of circuits, thanks to the parameter shift rule. OK, so what's next? Or what next? <laughs> um, well, I've presented to you a notion of quantum machine learning. It's this interplay between classical data and quantum devices. And then we built a very simple idea of a quantum classifier as a first attempt. And we discussed that um, it doesn't really seem to be a very exciting thing to do. So what's next is hopefully things that are exciting to you. And, um, and what you will see coming up is a few more algorithms that try to motivate more strongly why we should do certain things in quantum machine learning. So you'll see next the idea of QAOA. QAOA actually shows that um, these variational circuits can be beneficial in certain applications. Then next week, we will go heavily on the idea of quantum support vector machines, these idea of feature maps, quantum feature maps, kernels and quantum kernels, and how can we actually look at the right feature space? So how do we actually encode our data into a correct state that is meaningful for, meaningful for us in a quantum machine learning context?
So with that, I would like to, ah, oh, my last slide is, is gone. I would like to conclude and thank you for listening to the lecture. And I look forward to seeing you guys in the next talks. Take care.